the US and its Western allies have been running a concerted political and media campaign for months, accusing China of genocide and human rights violation against Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. As part of this relentless campaign, American think tank New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy and Canadian NGO Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights published a joint report titled The Uyghur Genocide earlier in March, in which over 50 supposedly independent global experts reiterated the accusations against China. However, a postmortem of the New Lines Wallenberg report by Sweden based Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research found the anti China claims to be fabricated, politically motivated, and based on accounts from dubious sources. These findings were published in an analytical report authored by Jan Oberg, co-founder of Transnational Foundation, Gordon Dumoulin, a Beijing-based Dutch educator and cross-cultural expert, and Thor Westby, a former Norwegian mayor and member of parliament. We are joined by the three authors to understand what drives the Western propaganda on Xinjiang. Welcome to CGTN Digital, Mr. Dumoulin, Mr. Oberg, and Mr. Westby. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. So my first question is for you, Mr. Dumoulin. Your analytical report suggests that the New Lines Wallenberg report that screams Uyghur genocide on its cover deserves to be thrown in the bin. You and your fellow co-authors here say that the report can't be called independent, that it is fabricated and based on biased sources. Please share with us what prompted you to carry out this postmortem and what are your key findings? Yes, first of all, um, this report uh, um, was published in uh, March this year uh, and was written, as you said, by the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy and by the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, uh, both uh, the first one uh, based in Washington, second one based in Montreal. And they indeed uh, claim an independent expert's opinion uh, um, confirming uh, the genocide in Xinjiang based on the uh, 1948 Genocide Convention. And this report was actually immediately and widely reported uh, by, by mainstream media uh, such as C CNN, The Guardian, and also other mainstream media. And it was seemingly another final confirmation that the genocide is actually taking place in Xinjiang because not a single Western mainstream media uh, even bothered to check the sources uh, or even questioning the independence as they claim in the report. Genocide is an extremely serious accusation, uh, uh, to say the least. Uh, and um, we as associates, and uh, also Jan Oberg, uh, who's here as well, being the founder of, our, of the foundation, TFF, uh, this is the Transnational Foundation of, for Peace and Future Research, we really felt obliged to analyze the report more in depth uh, to conclude whether the report is so-called independent and also whether the conclusion is justified. Because especially there has not been a single critical voice in mainstream media on this report since its publication. Uh, so we analyzed this, uh, this report uh, and uh, our key findings of uh, our analyzed, ana analysis is that uh, this report is certainly not independent. And moreover, it doesn't present any new materials. Uh, the result is a, is a cooperation by at least six special interest groups who are also interconnected. And uh, when we talk about special interests, uh, uh, we can talk about interests such as anti-communism, -commun Christian fundamentalism, Muslim brotherhood, and even on the back, rightfully uh, uh, or straight, uh, the US, US foreign policy. And the combination of these interests is a negative attitude or actually sometimes hatred on China. Uh, which they do as well on Russia or Iran, for example. And on the other hand, it's a very strong push for U.S. world dominance uh, with their intervention policies. The report contains fake and dubious data, also biased choices of sources, and it leaves out uh, um, crucial perspectives, it leaves out crucial facts and concepts. 
And when we would be academically speaking, uh, um, I think when you would present this paper to a uh, renowned university, I think it will flunk at, at, at the first sight when you read this paper, uh, because it's not academic, it's not professional at all. It just appears as a support for hardline US foreign policy. And they are using it, or actually better misusing human rights concerns to promote anti-China agendas. So the objective of our analysis, uh, why we did this has not been whether to, to determine if there is a genocide or not. Our objective has been uh, to see whether the conclusion is justified. And what we have found is uh, in the report, makes us believe that if this is really the independent, highest quality documentation of a genocide in Xinjiang, then we, and I think people, may seriously doubt whether what goes on in Xinjiang is a genocide. So Mr. Oberg, uh, as Mr. Dumoulin just mentioned that you, and I mean all of you, discovered that the New Lines Warrenberg report is essentially a product of cooperation among individuals from at least six interest groups or milieu as you describe it in the in the in your analysis can you please elaborate on these groups and why are they colluding against china well um, i think it's 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 always important without attacking individuals then ask yourself where do they come from what what is the environment the intellectual um, milieu from where the authors are coming and we should be aware that this report has been allegedly contributed to by very many scholars some of whom also as far as i understand the report have not wanted to have their names mentioned but if you look at the new lines institute uh, it is set up by a person who has relations to the muslim brotherhood and who also has a private university uh, and it's not clear at all what is the status of these two things. Uh, so that's one. And of course, I can imagine that there would be people with that attitude who try to defend what is going, what the uh, Uyghurs uh, have done with violence. Uh, I don't know it. It's not stated that way. But the New Lines Institute professes to be a, a peace oriented. Its goal being to uh, help the peace and humanity to solve its problems. And then you have the other things. I mean, one of the, the, the researcher who is most quoted by this report is, is the German Adrian Sens, um, who is known to be, and who, uh, according to his own words, is a, is a strong Christian believer. Uh, some would call him a fundamentalist, who's also said uh, on an American television program that he feels that he has God's mandate to do these things. Uh, write the stuff he does. He's quoted more than anyone else. Uh, others that you will find are people with a close relationship to a hardline Israeli politics. And um, many of those who are involved, uh, either in the first circle of authors or the second uh, circle of authors, are related both to Pentagon or State Department as consultants or something else. And they have written other stuff also before this uh, report was published, arguing for a hardline US policy against China. So uh, the, the whole thing seems to be, you know, uh, smelling of having a second agenda and less noble motives and less peaceful motives than uh, we would otherwise expect people who are concerned about human rights to have. And what does your analysis find about the Xinjiang Victims Database, uh, shahid.biz online portal, that the New Lines uh, Wallenberg report frequently uses to cite alleged Uyghur victims. Mr. Oberg? <clears throat> yes, it, it, the report has basically two sources. One is this, this uh, website, which I shall uh, uh, criticize in a moment, but also be aware that the far majority of the sources are media reports in mainstream Western media plus uh, radio programs financed by the US government, such as Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia, which by the way, are going to get a boost now 
by the new congressional law uh, on competing with China. It's called S1169 and the world better remember or learn that by heart, S1169, which says that there shall now be spent millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on negative propaganda, negative media coverage of the Belt and Road Initiative and other Chinese issues. Let me come back to the uh, database homepage. Now, the first thing you wonder is why is it a dot bits uh, site, uh, and which would indicate, you know, it's a business. Uh, and I don't think a database uh, about victims of, of genocide should have anything to do with business. That should have been a dot org. Secondly, I always tell my students what they can rely on and what they cannot rely on. And I would say the minimum is there must be an about page. There is not such an about page. There must be an address. There must be some names of those who are editing or structuring or directing that website in, the, in, in daily life from article to article, post to post. There must be a postal address, a contact address, telephones, emails, or whatever, so that the organization behind the site can be contacted. None of this is found on the database that is used here, 14, I think it's 14,000 victims and their uh, testimony uh, or testimony by others. So uh, I think it's a highly dubious thing. Now, if it is genuine, you ask your question as a researcher, why on earth are these normal indicators and elements of a website not present if you want to document a genocide? And I'm appalled by the fact that those who have reported on this uh, genocide in the Western press, have not taken the trouble to check such a source that's available for anyone. You can do it on the internet sitting on your chair. Or they are aware that it is not reliable and not a trustworthy homepage the way it is today. And then they anyhow use it. I cannot understand how this can be compatible with public service, television and radio. I cannot understand how this can be good journalistic practice. Um, it's, it's rather lousy, actually, that it's a research foundation like ours who are supposed to, you know, explain that this is not trustworthy. That should have, a professional journalist should have seen it immediately. And also, finally, all the journalists I have written to personally and who've gotten the TFF press info with this report, not one of them have responded and said, we're, we're happy to be informed about this. We have overlooked it or something like that. You know, there's total silence on, in, on, in, in the Western media. It's, it's a perfectly valid point that you make, and, and a, a source like that is certainly questionable. Uh, if I can come to you, uh, Mr. Westby, the analysis also draws an interesting parallel between China's war on terror in Xinjiang and the U.S. global war on terror launched after the September 11 attacks in 2001 and their respective human costs. Uh, there seems to be an uh, evident double standard on how these two incidents are treated by the Western, particularly the US governments and policymakers. Your comments? Well, you know, um, when President Bush, a few days after the tragic 9-11, when he came up and made his first speech, he was using the phrase, smoke them out and hunt them down. Uh, I would say this is a kind of uh, cowboy language uh, and it's, probably natural for the Americans to use that language. Um, you know, this, this war on terror, uh, it has really had a tragic human cost. Uh, the estimates goes from, and in these 20 years, from 800,000 to several millions, four to six million. And most of them are civilians. A deep tragedy. Uh, the former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, she said in an interview in 2011, when being asked if this um, killing of 500,000 children, if that was worth it, and she confirmed the price is worth it. Then, if you go to the Chinese side, 
And they, in the same time of period of time, they had a lot of terror attacks, especially in the Xinjiang province. Uh, the last one in April 2014 in Urumqi, where 31 was killed and hundreds injured. Then China said, we want to stop it. 13,000 was arrested, four was sentenced, four was sentenced to death. Uh, they pulled out uh, heavy security checks. They built up vocational camps that included de-radicalization -radical programs like we are having in the West. Um, and these were actually also supported by the World Bank. So when you compare this to TIP formulated, the US, uh, they look upon every Muslim as a terrorist. China is saying no one is born a terrorist. So the result after these 20 years, if you take the American model, everything has got worse. If you take the Chinese model, everything has got better. That's an interesting contrast. Uh, Mr. Dumoulin, uh, if you can throw some light on how the Western media has covered the New Lines Wallenberg report, uh, considering the many lapses in report uh, as exposed in your analysis, why haven't we seen a more critical approach by the Western mainstream media, uh, which actually prides itself, itself for being independent and objective? Do you think the media is also uh, now co-opted in this propaganda against China? Actually, this is just an example, this report of a wider, uh, let's call it media propaganda about picturing China as the subject of all evil. Uh, uh, nothing what's happening in China is good, uh, uh, whether it's governance. Uh, um, uh, so all the policies are um, made for something evil. Uh, and this is not only about Xinjiang. This is also a, about Hong Kong. This is about security threats. Uh, the South China Sea, uh, name it, uh, and um, any reports, uh, any any reporting in Western media um, is negative. And what is very concerning is that the fact checking, um, independence of reporting, is fading away from this China reporting in the West, uh, and. Uh, like uh, Mr. Oberg already said, uh, um, there's even an act now, uh, it's called, a, a, he, he calls it by the number S1169. The name is Strategic Competition Act of 2021. And the competition, uh, it's not written in the title, but it's against China. And they don't even hide anymore that the media is part of, um, as we call it, military, industrial, media, academic complex. Uh, this is the evolution of the military, industrial complex. Media is involved now. And in this new act, um, indeed, it includes the allocation of hundreds of millions of dollars for media-focused initiatives against China, including 300 million alone for spreading negative information about the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm. 300 million alone for independent media, so-called independent media. Mm. And it funds, it will fund anti-Chinese influence programs, and it will even include training Western journalists to better counter Beijing. Uh, and this development is more than worrisome. Uh, I mean, uh, the people in the West will just have one single perspective about China, and that is an evil perspective. This perspective will stimulate public opinion. And why and, and for what purpose? The purpose to serve the political agenda in the West. Right. And on the military industrial media academic complex uh, and its connection with the news line, uh, New Lines Wallenberg report, uh, Mr. Ober, can you throw some more light on that? Can you explain how are these uh, connected? Yes, just very quickly. Um, the military industrial media academic complex, it's a long one, uh, MIMAC, uh, is something I have developed as a concept on the base of uh, former President Eisenhower's uh, mentioning in his farewell speech that the military industrial complex 
had taken over too large a part of the US society and economy and it should be controlled, otherwise it would begin to control the US. And I think it's fair to say today that the United States does not have a military industrial complex. It has become a military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. If you look at the figures, if you look at the $750 billion for this and homeland security and veterans and all that, it's totally in a class of its own in terms of military consumption and spending and wasting in, a, in an era in which it has less and less good economy overall and in which the world desperately needs resources for other things than, than if I may, a stupid militarization because the military cannot solve any of the problems we have with the environment or with poverty or inequality or whatever. Long story short, a number of the people who contributed to this report do have a background uh, related to those circles, uh, the military or the, of course, academia, but also private academia as consultants who are working on contracts with various types of US forces or uh, command centers or something like that, <clears throat> or naval colleges or whatever. And those backgrounds are not mentioned in the New Lines report when they go through, you know, the short CVs, four or five lines for each person. They are not mentioned. It's when you start doing research on a person's name, you find out that they are connected in other ways also that is not uh, visible in the report. Um, of course, you cannot write 10 pages CV for, for each contributor, but you could at least have a hint that some of these people are, have their, you know, interest in the military, the industry, uh, uh, or, or in, in research or whatever that I have said now is part of, you know, the, the elite interests who has a common interest in promoting militarism, warfare, interventionism, rather than peace and dialogue and confidence building. And that's what I think is important to reveal, because we, we have so much fake and omission in Western media and also in, re, in research that some of us who are truly independent and not financed by governments or business can point out that, you know, things are not what they um, uh, are trying to, to look like they are. Uh, and Mr. Westby, uh, right now it seems that the popular narrative in most of the Western media uh, on Xinjiang uh, is that China is doing everything wrong and it is anti-Muslim. Uh, however, none of the major Muslim countries seem to have uh, bought this narrative yet. While the US and a handful of mostly Western countries have been pushing the UN for action over the alleged human rights violations in Xinjiang, most Muslim majority countries, including Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, and Egypt, and also many African countries have actually opposed any interference in China's internal affairs. What do you make of this tug of war on Xinjiang at the UN? I would like to answer this or comment this um, with two fact points. One is that in Xinjiang, there are 25,000 mosques and with a Muslim population of oh, 12,500, 12 million 500, that means every 500 Muslim have a mosque. In Turkey, where 99% are Muslims, they have 82,000 mosques and 82 million people. That means for every 1,000 people, there is a mosque. And the second point, is about the birth rate, the fertility rate. In 1950, the figure was 5.5 children per woman. Now, it is estimated in 2050 that it will be way below two. Um, and the main reason for this is, and everybody agrees on this, is the race of the living standard. Now we are talking about Xinjiang, and China has since 2016 had the two-child policy, but the Uyghurs are exempted for that. They can still have as many children as they want. So I would say that these two points that I just mentioned, they are actually um, pointing on the fact that Xinjiang is a Muslim-friendly province. Considering the devastating results of U.S. policies in Muslim countries, uh, 
such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and even Palestinian territories. Uh, can the US and uh, most of its Western allies claim to be the legitimate voice for the rights of Uyghur Muslims, uh, Mr. Dumoulin? Um, yes, I mean, generally, more generally, but we also can talk um, about Muslims here. Uh, can they be the legitimate voice for human rights? Huh? Um, in this way, you already give examples, and these are examples for, from, from just two decades. Can you imagine two decades? <laughs> That's gone in a flash, and there have been many things going on in these two decades. Uh, um, it's questionable uh, whether the U.S. and Western allies are really caring for the Uyghur minority uh, uh, in China and for the people in Afghanistan or Libya or Syria or, or the Palestinian territories. Uh, um, and then I say just the least, it's questionable. If we look at the results, uh, um, I think uh, uh, the question mark is getting much bigger. Uh, and even we see it today now uh, in, in the Palestinian territories, uh, the devastating developments, what's happening these days. A look at the voice of the Western governments. A look at the voice of the Western media about this situation. It's quite a different voice than the voice against China, consider the Uyghur population, right? So when we are truly talking about human rights or claiming to be a voice for human rights, I think we first should start with a mirror a look into our own countries. And secondly, even equally important, what we as a country, and not we, but uh, as a country where you come from, what you do in other foreign countries. Uh, uh, it has already been mentioned, uh, the, the cost of war, uh, that was a report published uh, last year by the Watson Institute in Rhode Island. Uh, they analyzed the costs of war, cost of war, not in dollars, but in human lives by the wars on terror, which were in, initiated by the U.S. and its Western allies. And as Mr. Vesby already said, um, 800,000 to a few million people dead from war alone. An estimated 3 million people dead from poverty, disease, because of total destructions of national systems, healthcare systems, everything. 37 million people were forced to flee their homes for war, not only for war, but also for political and religious fears. Human rights we are talking about. And how about this report? There's not a single word in Western governments or in media about this report, about these horrifying violations. So human rights and its violations, they are actually highly politicized. Why? To serve agendas. And these agendas are not for humanity, but for dominance <laughs> and for supremacy. And actually, this politicization alone is the largest human rights violation. My last question is to you, Mr. Oberg. Uh, as someone dedicated to the cause of peace, what will be your advice to policymakers in both the US and many other Western countries and in China to ensure that confrontation over Xinjiang doesn't escalate into a full-blown crisis? That's what they call a good question. <laughs> uh, I think actually I would like to answer it this way. I think we should not, if you buy decision makers mean governments, I don't think we should be too uh, rely, relying on them. The US has put itself, it seems to me, in terms of economy, politics, and media on the track for Cold War with China in the future. I would like to instead look at what can people do? What can society do? What could civilians do? What could citizens do? Which I know also is a much closer idea to the social philosophy of China. The people are important, you know. We can't sit and wait for leaders just doing things. We have to listen to the people. So I would, I'm thinking of citizens' diplomacy. I'm thinking of citizens touring um, to each other's countries, learning from each other. I'm thinking of school exchanges, a lot of culture. I think culture is tremendously important, exhibitions, ballets, music, and all that. Look at the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra as, as an example, what it has done for bridge building. 
I think researchers could have much more dialogues. I could think we could have professions, engineers in China and the West coming together because they're engineers and talk with each other about things. You know, when you have a common profession, you have already something to stand on and talk about, whether you're a doctor, an engineer, or a priest, or whatever you are. I think we should think of citizens' media, citizens' journalism, which we already have because we know there are very brilliant people who are sitting in China, live in China from the West who are reporting to the West and to everybody who cares to listen uh, much better than professional journalists are doing. I'm not saying better because they have other views. I'm saying them simply more professional and know things on the ground to an extent that many journalists don't do. So I'm, I'm thinking much more of a people to people approach to this. Uh, we don't have time to wait for the American empire to fall first and the Americans to come to their senses. Unfortunately, I'm very sad saying that, but I don't think there's much hope in the present American leadership or in NATO countries' leadership when it comes to a more benign attitude and a more uh, win-win attitude uh, to China. And I say that because it's self-destructive for the US what it does at the moment. It is standing in the way for what China wants to achieve for its people and the win-win solutions that is built into the Belt Road Initiative. And worst of all, it has nothing to do with world leadership that Biden now says that America is back as a leader. It's a misleader because that type of cold policy, we do not have one day for that type of cold, cold war policies given the problems all humanity has. So humanity ought to protest this cold war wherever it comes from or for whatever reasons it has to stop. And that must be by the citizens of the world who say we don't want any more of this militarism and this militarist thinking. Well, on that note of optimism, thank you very much, all of you, uh, Mr. Dumoulin, Mr. Oberg, and Mr. Wesby, for joining me and uh, uh, giving your perspective on this contentious topic of uh, Xinjiang and what's happening there in Xinjiang. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Thank you for having.